Sado, Sado, Sado. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Dhammaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Saṅgaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's like having a clean slate, a crisp new page upon which you may go ahead and start writing. Every time we sit, allowing the mind, allowing the expectations and all the secret Hidden, hidden agendas to just be put aside for a second. That's what we do when we meditate. Ideally, that's what we should be doing. Unfortunately, most of us start with a series of hidden agendas. One of the good things, one of the good prompts that I encourage people to use while sitting or while just living your life is simply to ask yourself this very simple basic question. What is my attitude? What is my attitude? We've all used or use a GPS system, correct? When you want to go somewhere, you pull out a new address when you're going to go ahead and uh, go to a new place, probably get a grab, a taxi. You have to put down first the address, where it is your goal, your destination. Without that, it's impossible for the grab to know to even show up at your doorstep. That is having a trajectory, a destination, what we talk about as having the right attitude. Unfortunately, many of us actually live entire lives with the wrong attitude. Bhante, how come it's not working? That's something I hear about, uh, you know, a lot from students. I'm doing whatever I can, but nothing's happening. Well, are you following the steps? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm doing, I, I'm taking my precepts, my five precepts, I'm doing those. I'm practicing meditation, I'm watching my breath, or I'm practicing metta. But nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Well, that's not true. Something's always happening. Always. It is one's own expectation, or expectations, plural, that hold oneself away from actually living at the present moment fully. They're too enmeshed in other things, other thoughts, other desires, and other beliefs concepts. In the Dhamma we have a term, a beautiful term, it's called papanchas. Papanchas. It's a Pali term which means um, intense conceptualization or mental proliferation. Constantly. Constantly going on in the mind which does not allow us to see in Pali, the word that Lord Buddha used is dithi, dithi. In Sanskrit, it would be drishti. But he added a qualifier to it. He said samadithi, as opposed to michadithi. 
Mitcha or just Ditti would be wrong view. We cannot start on this path, on this journey, which we call Patipada, which is the training, the path, capital P, without first starting with Samaditi. Sometimes we think that it's only once. You just have to get the trajectory once and you're good to go. Did you eat last Thursday? Did you breathe earlier this morning? How come you're still breathing? How come you're still going to eat tomorrow? I'm not trying to ask a whimsical question, but basically I'm trying to point out how this is a constant process. One of the things which I had a really difficulty understanding Buddhist cosmology or how things have started coming from a Christian background I sat in front of my teacher as far back as I remember a Buddhist monk whose name was mentioned Bhante Ratanasara an elderly monk Mahatera and I said Bhante I don't understand there has to be a beginning there has to be a beginning and he said no Chandana that's wrong view. And he said, what? Wrong view. It's a process, he said. And the word that he used is a continuum. Continuum. Life is a continuum. We often like to have a beginning point and an end point. What I like to call Disney-esque way of thinking. You know that term? And they lived happily ever after. Fairy tales, movies, Hollywood. That's what they do. All constructed upon the fickle, shaky legs of wrong view. And the Dhamma comes to pull the rug from underneath that. And this is a problem for many of us who have been lost in this michaditi all throughout our lives in this culture that we're living in, which is a culture, unfortunately. It's no longer a mixture because we're all influenced. It's a global community now. And it's a global wrong view. You go everywhere. You see this. It's spread. And that is the real virus, I call it. And my students are shocked. That is the real virus. Wrong view. With right view, you can fix anything. We all have immune systems, you know. That's how our ancestors got us this far. We've forgotten that. We're reaching out for the outside world for security. Give me this. I want this. I need to make sure these things are there in order for me to feel safe. Wrong view. Because the Dhamma says clearly, Safety happens within you, within your heart, within your mind. Now, not just as a bhikkhu do I know this, but also as a psychotherapist, as Brother Leslie said. I have gone through PTSD, and that's the bit that I didn't... Usually when Brother Leslie would introduce me, he would mention the past that I've had with PTSD as a child growing up in Lebanon, where I was born. I was injured and uh, that's where I lost portions of my foot and I was injured and I was in the ICU intensive care unit for a long time etc etc but that made me become very fascinated with the human potential to overcome and become resilient to difficulties it's wonderful how a human being has the potential potential to do miracles to overcome so many challenges and not to be crushed under the weight of outside circumstances right view by the way in therapy we have you know very fancy words one of them is resiliency resilience 
When a person overcomes tragedies, highly stressful situations, trauma, PTSD being one of them, in the earlier days of World War I, it used to be called shell shock. Same damaging symptoms. But over the years, it re received many you know, syllables, but basically it's the same thing. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, why do I mention this? Because when a person is traumatized, that becomes their shadow. That becomes their reality. That becomes their life. That, in essence, is the opposite of right view, which I would like to talk about today. Because it is like the North Star. Years ago, when we used to go camping, we would use a compass. We didn't have a GPS. So you use the compass to go into the wilderness and to navigate and to know which landmarks to follow and to see whether you're going to get to your destination in time before sunset. One time we actually got caught in the wilderness in the dark. <laughs> we didn't calculate well enough. But basically, knowing the North Star is number one, and that is the right view which Lord Buddha started talking about in the Eightfold, Noble Eightfold Path. And that is why I wanted to talk about uh, this when, when Brother Leslie asked me what would I like to talk about. That is the most basic, fundamental, exceedingly important step that can never be undermined, can never be neglected. Because everything depends on it. As a world population, we've been wanting, craving, looking for every means of securing ourselves a sense of safety. Which, by the way, trauma patients don't have. Trauma patients don't have that sense of safety if they've lost it. And you do not need to be in a war zone, be kidnapped, be harassed or even worse, raped, in order for you to have experienced trauma. As a world population, almost 8 billion of us have been traumatized today. People are afraid everywhere you go. Right after COVID started, there was a need for me to be um, in Europe. In fact, that part of Europe that was hit the hardest, Northern Italy, Milan to be specific. So I found myself in an empty airport in Los Angeles, getting on a plane to go to Milan because people were traumatized. Traumatized everywhere you go. People are afraid to look at you, to look at each other. That, oh, and let's not forget children. Today, children don't know how to, especially very young infants, don't know how to look at each other, especially how to pronounce words in their own native languages. Because the child needs to look at the mother, at the father, to see how the parents are enunciating the words, whether they're speaking Chinese, Swahili, English. So now, speech therapists are being called in because children are unable to properly and fluently say the words at that specific age as normally they should have. So the effects of the, the trauma, we should be able to say it like it is. It's a trauma that we went through for two years. And to this day, people are afraid. People are afraid. And that is, again, taking us back to the absence of right view. When we allow the situations to invade our mind and to replace the inner safety that comes through the practice of the Dhamma to be replaced by this false Dhamma, which Lord Buddha calls it Adhamma, 
there are terms for this. 2,600 years ago, the Lord Buddha figured it out. In fact, he was the first to even call out mental disorders. Not as disorders, of course, but he said there's two kinds of sickness. There's physical sickness and mental sickness. Before anyone had figured it out. Before the Greeks. Now, this is not a history lesson, of course, but I wanted to have us go back, even though I write notes and I never seem to look at them. Um, we need to go back to the basics. What is right view? Well, for starters, it is the opposite of wrong view. In the first sutta of the Digha Nikaya, it's called the Brahma Jala Sutta, the net of views. Lord Buddha talks about 64 different types of views. That all the views that you have, all the beliefs, all the philosophical standpoints, ideas, theories, fall into those 64. They have to do with extremes, basically, to narrow it down. There's two. One is the nihilistic or nihilistic view. The other one is called the, uh, uh, the eternalist view. The nihilistic view sometimes call, is called annihilationist view. Meaning, once a person dies, lights out. That's the end of it. The other one says... Let's just worry about the next life. Let's, not just, let's just focus on what will happen. One of the whimsical things that I see sometimes or read in Buddhist circles is uh, when a person dies, for example. Here, I'm sure you hear this. I mean, I just got to the Vihara two days ago, but I'm sure you hear this. You hear this everywhere in the world in Buddhist centers. They say, and may he attain Nibbana. May she attain Nibbana. What happened to this life? Why, why not this life? How come they, they never actually achieved it here? Why next? So there's a postponement, constant postponement, presuming that it's going to happen in the next one. Or may they attain, you know, uh, go to another realm or something. While the focus is being lifted off of the present life. So this is one extreme, the eternalist view. You also have this in the Judeo-Christian religions, like in the case of, for example, heavens and hells. Eternal hell, eternal damnation. That's a wrong view, completely. But then there's the other extreme, right? The annihilationist or the nihilistic. Now that is the predominant view today. That is the predominant view today. Everywhere you go, you, go, you see it. Earlier I mentioned briefly about the fear. Fear. Don't touch me. Stay away. Da -da -da. All these things. Let me make sure this. People have been swimming inside of, uh, you know... Um, sanitation thingies, like I forgot, the, the, the antiseptic and, and all these liquids to sanitize themselves to the point where they got sick and died. Extreme. There's no limits to stupidity. That's the wrong view. Why though? Because the person deep down feels that the moment that moment, that, that moment comes where they have to go, they die, that's it. And deep down, that is their view, ultimately. Because they see the body as myself. This is me. This is who I am. This is mine. The basis of ignorance, Lord Buddha calls it. And he had a term for it. Asmimana, the conceit I am. The conceit I am. That conceit does not belong outside of the Buddhist circles, you know. I've met many people who consider themselves Buddhists, and they've been Buddhists far longer than I have, obviously. Monks, not monks, lay people, 
nuns, doesn't make a difference. Simply because a person calls themselves a Buddhist doesn't mean that they're not subscribing to either of these two extreme views. Remember what I was mentioning about we have to first check our attitude, whether we're meditating or not, whether we're taking a step. Check your attitude. And there's a term that we have, another one. Majjimapada, the middle path. The middle path is what? It's the Eightfold Path. Samaditi is number one. Samma Sankappa is number two. Right intention. Sometimes called right thought. So, when we have a better appreciation of our circumstances, without letting us go off the rails, as we say in English, without losing ourselves, then you start having a more relaxed attitude with life. When I was in the U.S., um, I had the need to uh, resume my practice on a limited uh, scale as a, as, a, as a psychotherapist because I was seeing so many people depressed and ang anxious. People who normally would see 10 patients were now seeing 100. Economically, financially speaking, they were really getting a lot of money in. But I was seeing the number increasing in such an exponential rate as a very dangerous sign of our times. People were no longer able to cope with their symptoms because there was a major problem at the core of what people were looking at for safety. They were looking at it, looking for it outside of themselves. And that is what I would like us to approach right view with. Because I don't want it just to be technical instructions and mentions of uh, different suttas or commentaries as to what samaditi means. Because I need, the way I have always functioned as an instructor, as a teacher, and as a Dhamma teacher has always been, what can the person, the listener, go home with that could prove for themselves to be useful. Ultimately, that's what it means. Otherwise, why do we even get education? It needs to be beneficial to me, for me, right now, and for the world around me. Now, having said this, there are primary foundational elements that we need to be very cognizant of meaning the three trainings, sila, samadhi, and panya. These are unavoidable. These have to be there. Now, sila is the first level of training. Over the course of more than three decades, being in different viharas, I've seen how Buddhists always approach Pujas. And you also see this in other religions. And Lord Buddha calls this rites and rituals, belief in rites and rituals, ultimately. Now, don't get me wrong, doing dana is a wonderful way to gain merits. That is undeniable. It's powerful. But I would like you to be encouraged to include sati with that mindfulness with your puja. I was mentioning this to a student overseas today. One minute of sati is worth a lifetime of puja. One minute of sati. A lifetime of puja? A lifetime of puja, Bhante. That's what I'm saying. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the puja is not important or making an offering is not important. Now, imagine if you can combine the two. That is a wonderful combination. And that's why Lord Buddha believed in formulas, structures. I had a professor once, years ago, and he would say, Chandana, the Dhamma that Lord Buddha taught is, when I was a layman, he would say this in, in, uh, in class, the Dhamma is the religion of numbers, he would say. Three of this, two of that, four of this, eight of this, twelve of that, seven of those. But it's an amazing way to, it's a mnemonic device basically, it's a, it's a device, it's a method to make the person remember these very uh, interesting and intricate principles. Now some might think, oh the Dhamma is too complicated. In order for me to have right view, I also have to know all the Dhamma Bhante? No. No. You don't need to know the suttas. You don't need to memorize them. You don't. There have been arahants to this day. There are arahants today, by the way, in case you have doubts. In the world. Who are not educated. They're illiterate. They don't have a degree. They probably can't even write their name down on a piece of paper. But they have a clear understanding of what they need to be doing on a consistent basis. Earlier we started with meditation. You connected with your body. Right? I mentioned about the breath or sensation in the body. I was mentioning this earlier during lunch to some dayakas who were present. Let's do an experiment. Without looking, without looking, see how your feet are arranged. Are they crossed? Is one over the other? Without looking. Can you feel? Can you feel perhaps tension? Can you feel how they are arranged? Is one pressing against the other? Are they equally placed on the ground? Are they lifted off the ground? Are they crossing over? Which leg is crossing over what? You just practiced sati. How difficult was that? Did it take any energy from you? Very simple. Now how much or how often can we practice this? That's the question. Sometimes people come and say, oh, in order for you to become a sotapanna, which is a stream winner, the first stage of awakening, you must be uh, a monk or a nun for 10 years at least. You must know the suttas, you must know Pali, you must know, no, no, must, 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 must. No, you don't. When you read the life of the Buddha and the life of the Arya Savakas, you study how so many people, so many lay people became sotapannas, stream winners, once returners, non returners and arahants even but they couldn't stay arahants once you're you know you're an arahant you have to renounce because it's so powerful but imagine the technique that lord buddha was giving to people that was useful enough for them to break through wrong view By the way, how is this so far? Because I'm gauging you and I'm gauging, trying to uh, see how this is uh, registering. Uh, because I don't like to uh, speak to, you know, concepts and all that. 
there's a place and time for that as well, of course, but I would like to have, you know, input and feedback. So you can nod if, if, if there's questions, please, uh, we can address them as well. Uh, but uh, seems to be okay. <laughs> okay. Um, in other words, right view, uh, okay, good. I have a thumbs up. Um, right view has everything to do with living your life. See, I do not like it when the student comes and says, Dhamma has, happens for me, Bhante, when I am at the temple. Why? Do you have your body with you when you go to the bathroom? When you eat, when you breathe, when you go to work? Okay, the Dhamma has to be holding your hand. Or actually, you have to be holding the Dhamma's hand. Sammasati. Again, there was a need for Lord Buddha to use the word Samma. We live in a world where it's a topsy-turvy situation. It's like a salad bowl of different things, different ideas. And people presume that this is what the Buddha says. If you go on social media, you see, let's say, Facebook or things like that. You see quotes, uh, quotes as well. The Buddha says this. Well, over 60 or 80% of those quotes are not the statements of Lord Buddha. People have added them over time. So there needs to be some due diligence on our part to do some homework. Yes, there is that. And that's where you coming to the temple, asking questions, going online, reading actual suttas. And that's one of the reasons why I started that project that Brother Leslie was talking about, of narrating all the suttas in English. So you don't, because many people are busy. I did it because one time one of my students said, uh, I wasn't a monk then, and I said, you need to read the Majjhima Nikaya, or the Dhammapada, I don't remember which one, and I was holding the book, and they saw me holding the book, and it's this thick, and the pages are very thin, you can see through, that's how thin, and plus it has so many parts missing. And I was holding the book and they said, but look how thick the book is. I don't have time to read. I'm doing my, you know, university work and I'm doing my PhD. I don't have time to read. And I said, aha, that gives me an idea. This person drives one hour each way to go to school and to come back. One hour. They listen to the radio. What if... They listen to the Dhamma. But there's no, at that time, it was none. In fact, I got uh, the book from, uh, I had a copy of uh, the late uh, Venerable uh, Kesri Dhammananda's Dhammapada. And I said, that's a great book. I, I'm going to narrate that. And I started narrating it, including the commentaries. Wonderful stories in the back. And this student, studied, studied the Dhammapada while they were going back and forth to school. That allows the person to relinquish, to uproot the wrong view. So yes, there needs to be some level of education, which means commitment. You had to commit to come today. You could have been doing something else. Maybe something more fun, instead of sitting in a room and listening to this person. But you committed. You said, no, I'm going to be here at this time. Every moment that you check your body, right now, play this game with yourself. What is the loudest 
sensation I'm feeling in my body right now. Check. Maybe it's an itch. Maybe it's a, you want to scratch somewhere. Maybe it's the way you're sitting. Maybe left side is a little bit more heavier, like you're pushing down. Maybe one leg is up. Maybe one hand is over the other. You're wearing a mask. See if there's any tension from the strap around the ears. Are both the same? Or is one a little bit more than the other? These tiny little adjustments of your mindfulness allows you to become more present. But present to do what? Present to do what? Because in the Noble Eightfold Path, we also have what? Samasati. Right mindfulness, as opposed to wrong mindfulness. You know, a sniper, someone who kills people with a gun, with a rifle, from afar, is very good at mindfulness. When I say this to students in America, they're, they're usually shocked first. They're mindful. Yes, they're murderers. They kill people with a rifle from a very far distance. But they're very mindful of even their breath. In fact, I heard one of them say once, you have to shoot between heartbeats. Between heartbeats, look at the level of awareness. Level of awareness. I remember growing up in Lebanon. And when, you know, our parents would forbid us to go to certain areas of the city because there were snipers there at the top of the buildings. And you would hear some lady, some neighbor was shot and killed as she was carrying groceries, bags of groceries, because that's what they did. But they have to aim, they have to concentrate, they need to lock everything out and just be there present to do this. But this is wrong mindfulness. That's not the mindfulness we're talking about because Today you have mindfulness without sila in the world. Now that is michaditi. I have uh, acquaintances, fellow psychotherapists in the West, in the, in the US, who have written books on eating chocolate with mindfulness. Some people have said, how to make more money with mindfulness, how to invest and make more money, CEOs, how to become better CEOs, to become the next Elon Musk with mindfulness. People have monetized, monetized and even weaponized mindfulness today because they have been stripping the teachings from the Dhamma proper. And that's how you have John Kabat-Zinn, who's big name in the world today, MBSR and uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, it's called. Hundreds of millions of dollars money being made. In fact, is, I think he's a billionaire now. Removed from the Dhamma. So there's an infiltration, there's an infestation, if you will, of wrong view in the world. That's why I cannot stress this enough. Wherever I go, I always stress having samadhi. In our lives. But it has, doesn't necessarily just have to be about the Dhamma. It could be about your relationship. See, the Dhamma is not in just a religious context. And then it's not Dhamma. Dhamma is... Yes, it's the Buddhist teachings. Yes, that's one of the definitions. The other is natural law of things. How things are supposed to be. You break that law, 
suddenly there's a disharmony in your life. Disharmony in the way that you raise your children. Disharmony in the society that we live in. So, by practicing wrong view, in your relationship, suddenly you will find respect growing. Respect growing within people. When I used to do couples therapy, I don't do it now because as, as bhikkhus we have limitations, of course. Um, and uh, my preceptor has allowed me uh, to help people as a psychotherapist, but again with restrictions, of course. But back then, back in the day when I used to do couples therapy, I used to, uh, and couples would come and they would say, well, he's not respecting me or she's not respecting me, etc., etc., and, and there's not love, there's fighting, there's this, there's that. I would tell them a story of what I would notice in my own parents when I was a child. So, like any family, any healthy family, there are disagreements. And my parents used to argue. As a child, I used to be afraid because I'm watching my mom and dad fighting. I mean, arguing kind of thing. And as a child, you become traumatized if that goes on too much. But half an hour later, I would go and I would sit, see my mom sitting really close to my father. They're both drinking coffee. They used to love coffee. So my mom or my dad would make coffee and now they're sharing a coffee and they're laughing. <laughs> As a child, I would feel surprised and shocked and, and kind of surprised. Why are you now happy? Because I had this, you know, child's brain. Immediately, my mind would go to the Disney way of thinking. Love, love, oh yes, love, love, love. It must be love, that's why you're, you're, you know, laughing together. And I would be surprised to hear my parents' response. My mother would say, or my father, no son, that's not love. What? You mean to say that you are laughing together, not because of love, then what is it? And then I would actually confirm it. I would look at my other parent, like, is he saying the truth? And my mom would nod, and she says, yes, it's not love. Then what is it? What's the glue that's keeping you together? And they both would tell me, respect. Respect. You have respect, you will get love. You have love, that's temporary. Because it might be love, but it could be just physical attraction. It might be some other kind of attraction. But like anything else, anicca, anicca always is working in permanence. But respect, that can open the door for love to come into the life. Now having this view is right view. Unfortunately, today you have couples, you have families that are expecting X, Y, and Z criteria to be there first before they give you respect, before they give you, the, before they relax. Because they want a series of requirements first. Requirements first. So the Natural beauty is being taken out in our interactions, but it starts with us. How I view myself, that is, again, right attitude, which is right view. Right view is not something outside. I'm viewing something outside. That's not it. Samaditi. Samma also can mean wholesome, good, constructive right, appropriate. I remember Bhante Punnaji would teach me, he would say, harmonious perspective. Beautiful way of saying it. Harmonious. Depending on the conditions. 
once I uh, had a, a teacher who um, someone was saying something in the class. I was, I think, third grade or fourth grade ch child. And uh, she related this story that happened about 100 years ago. And in the story, a child, you know, in the old days, 100, 110, 15 years ago, uh, a child uh, is uh, not doing well at school and the teacher yells at the child and says, don't be an idiot like your father. Be smart. Something like that. And the child really gets offended and he goes straight home and tells his father. And in those days, the father just gets the shotgun, comes straight to the school to shoot the teacher because he insulted or yeah, he insulted the father. And there's a big commotion in the school, the principal or whoever is in charge of the school, they try to calm the situation and they pull the teacher out and they say, did you say this? And the man is raging mad, red, is ready to kill. And the teacher says, wait, 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 wait. I told your son, be smart like your father. Don't be an idiot. The words were kind of shifted. There was a comma that was removed. The message was taken out of context. And it was going to become fatal. Someone was going to die. Wrong view. So in that sense, the information that we put in our heads, really, really, we need to double check what it is that we're putting in there. Because whatever I am exposed to, that will become my reality, isn't it? That's why Dhamma sermons are extremely important. And if you can't find them live, well, now you can here. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, you know, but online there's, there's so much. And if that's not enough, there's the Dhamma that came out of Lord Buddha's own lips. There's Sutta Central, there's access to insight in English. There's, I'm sure, Sutta Central also has in different languages as well. And there's also the ones that I've prepared, and, and you can just listen. But please give yourself the opportunity to hear and be exposed, because that is going to influence your samadhi. It's not going to happen in a vacuum. That's the, positive, that's the active role, one of the active roles that you could play, instead of passively. The other one is actually when you can close the doors and the windows on things that are bringing more michaditi. Close the windows, close those openings, those access points of negativity. Negativity. There was a very famous uh, American uh, psychiatrist, uh, an MD. Uh, a medical doctor, who was also uh, a wonderful person, who came up with, uh, well, he did a series of research, uh, well, he did a, several experiments with, um, given the cases that he had, with individuals struggling with different mental disorders and states of being, which he called states of consciousness. And he arranged them numerically, starting with about uh, uh, 50 or 100, all the way to 1,000. His name, by the way, was uh, uh, Dr. Uh, David Hawkins, H-A-W-K-I-N-S, Hawkins. Um, and uh, so he said beautifully, and this is, this is basically he was talking about right view versus wrong view but he didn't know he was saying these things uh, because the Buddha talked about this and, uh, and he called it kileshas, the three poisons or the defilements in one's heart. Loba dosa moha. 
You might recall those. Greed, hatred, greed or lust, anger or hatred, and delusion. Now, what Professor or Dr. Hawkins was saying is negative states are powerful in their poisonous characteristic or characteristics in that they deplete you of energy. They deplete you of your immune system. Does that sound familiar? Two years living in this planet which had turned into a jail cell, a prison cell? It's like the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. But we've all been affected, unless you've been living alone under a rock in the desert somewhere. We've all been affected by this. And the reason why I bring him up, Dr. Hawkins, is because he says there's blame, there's shame, there's fear. Again, do those sound familiar? Pointing the finger at others, blaming yourself, blaming others. Fear, he lists the emotion of fear at a very, very low number. But interestingly enough, this is based on actual science and hard research, um, rigorous research that he had done. He says, as the person takes more courageous steps, they get to this number, which is 200. That's where he terms courage. Courage, the emotion of courage. How courage feels in your body, in your mind. There's a shift that happens in the person's life. Suddenly, you're able to stand up, to lift your head up. One of the things that happens to the posture of the body when a person is sad, in grief, or just depressed, is they start slouching, exactly. They start hunching. Their spine starts to curve. And their shoulders start to cave in, kind of coming forward closer. Especially it happens with someone who's been emotionally abused, betrayed, uh, lost someone, cheated, uh, horrible thing basically, where they felt defenseless or unprotected, weak basically. What are they doing when you do this and you're slouching? There's this thing in the center of your chest, right, called a heart. You're trying to protect it. The person curves, becomes like a question mark, walking. They're trying to protect themselves. But that, if that becomes your modus operandi, if that becomes your way of living, instead of courageously saying, okay, that happened yesterday, or 17 years ago, why do I have to carry this? I'm still alive. Let me smile. But I have no reason for it. But let me smile to myself. Let me be courageous. That is where the shift happens. And then there's a sense of acceptance. The person starts to see themselves able to take more chances. Yes, I lost all my wealth. Yes, I lost my partner. Yes, my loved one died. Yes, okay. Am I the only one that that happens to? No. So you mean to say that is kind of normal in life? Yeah. But that happened to me, why me? Well, that's one question, but there's a, even a better question. Why not me? What's so special about me that, no, it should not have happened to me? Why? There's eight billion of us. It should have happened to someone. It was going to happen. It happened to me. So approaching it like that, asking simple questions like that, 
gets us back to the right trajectory. Remember the GPS? You're putting now the right address for the grab to come and pick you up, to take you to the right place even better. So, and, and above 200, uh, I wanted to share that uh, information because, um, again, the Dhamma is not separate from other things that are happening. If it is the truth, meaning it is, it is part of the Dhamma, it's inescapable. It will, have, it will show itself if it is true. If it is not true, it's also going to show itself. That's the good thing about it. And uh, one of the uh, uh, characteristics, qualifiers that the Lord Buddha gave to describe qualifiers or qualifications, qualities of the Dhamma is sandittiko. Sandittiko means, there's also ditti if you notice in there, sandittiko. It means directly visible here and now. Very quickly. It's impossible for you to be mindful, especially smiling and laughing, and have an unwholesome state of mind. Try it. Genuinely smiling while you're mindful, while at the same time you're scheming, you're planning to kill someone, to steal someone. It doesn't work. It's like wanting to run forward, but somehow running backward at the same time. It doesn't work. Why? Because wanting to do wholesome actions is all about the Dhamma. And that's why Lord Buddha emphasized so much the role of kamma. Kamma is action, or karma in Sanskrit. It's action. It comes from the root kiru, action. And this is where we need to place the right attention on what kind of action it is that we're involved in. And for that, we have the beautiful, beautiful yoni somana sikara. Yoni so manasikara means wise, radical attention. Putting the attention where it needs to be. So, how can I present this in a way where it can be useful to you? Here it goes. Next time you're wisely reflecting, attentively, Reflect on what kind of news you are allowing to enter your ears. What are you observing with your eyes? Are you observing something negative? Are you observing or hearing something harsh, something negative? So-and-so uh, has killed some people. So-and-so is doing some bad things. Or they are saying they're going to be, the world climate is going bad, or this and that. All these are below the number 200, by the way. They drag us down to a lower state of awareness, lower state of mind. And that is what today's world media is trying to do constantly. So you need to unplug from that. Anything that puts you in a negative state of mind, pull the plug. Pull the plug. That means you are protecting your gates. You're protecting your mind. Now be alert, know what's going on, but just enough, just a little bit, not allowing it to dominate your mind, to dominate your life, to dominate your relationships. That is wrong view otherwise. So, making the Dhamma be relevant to your life has everything to do with you keeping your house clean. House meaning your mind, your heart, what you're putting in there, what you're putting inside your ears, 
in front of your eyes. Even before becoming a bhikkhu, I had given up the TV. Before my father died, uh, he, came, he, he asked me, son, I want to give you my big screen TV. And I said, why? Oh, it's expensive, son. You need to get it. And I said, no, I don't want it. Because everywhere you turn, every, you know, people watch Netflix, people watch this and that. And, and when you look at the quality of what it is that is being thrown at us, ask yourself, is there some Maditi here? Be responsible. This is your life. If we're not responsible, we're not practicing, plain and simple. There's no sati. So sati means I have to be alert as to what's coming through the six sense doors, the five senses plus the mind, and which is the most important. Because once you see something, it's gone, dead, gone. But your mind replays it keeps replaying it. In 2001, 9-11 happened in New York. But every single minute almost, they were replaying the videos of people falling from the two towers. The buildings fall. They terrorized the population of the United States and everywhere else it became normal to be traumatized. And everybody was glued to the screen. Everybody. Because there is, whether we like it or not, there is some level of excitement involved. Because there's also fear. There's also the uncertainty. How could this happen? It could happen to me. I don't want this to happen. We must do something. Well, you see what's happening? It's growing. When you are not in control, it means there's uncertainty. When you're not in control, there's an element of stress. And that element of stress no longer stays as a seed. It grows into resentment. That resentment turns into anger. Anger and hate and that index finger that points away from you, blame. Suddenly, peaceful people will end up doing some atrocious things, horrible things. And that's what happened. Millions of people were, de were dead. Even more so were dis displaced and countries were destroyed. Trauma. So let us protect the six sense doors. And that starts with Samaditi. Every step of the way. Every step of the way. Do I have the right attitude? That's, if you could just take that with you today, I think that's a good start. Everywhere you go, when you want to grab that thing at the supermarket, do I have enough money to buy this? Okay, yes, let's say. Do I really need this? No, I have two of them. Do I need this? No, but I want to. Why? Asking the why is part of samaditi because it takes courage to stand instead of just grab and go. Years ago, I used to train people uh, as, as in a gym, as a fitness trainer. So people would come to me, uh, from what I remember, they would say, um, I want to lose weight, for example. But I get up in the middle of the night and I go to the kitchen and I open the fridge door, refrigerator door, and I start eating. Yeah, and I say, okay. Back then I would teach them mindfulness by saying, okay, I need you to stop, hold the door of the refrigerator, but don't promise me you're not going to reach inside yet until you ask this question from yourself. Hello, stomach. Are you really hungry? Ask that question. And if you don't get a response, 
no one thing because it's your head. It's your addiction. It's your habit that says, no, 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 I need to eat this. No, you don't. Because you have enough food for the next 50 years on your body because there's so much fat there. <laughs> I was very unusual fitness trainer and they would accept that from me because I was coming from a good place. It's funny. And if it really needs to, they really need to eat something, eat a cucumber or a lettuce. It has zero calories. In fact, it might have even a negative calorie. And the person, like, yeah, okay. And they start to listen to the body. Do I really need to take this? Right view versus wrong view. You're driving the car and someone does something in front of you and you're really angry. And you start yelling. In Los Angeles, it's called, you know, road rage. I think it's worldwide now. People yell. Sometimes you see them in the car, screaming in the car by themselves. There's no one in the car, just them. They think that they know who the person is driving in the car in front of them. So they, in their mind, they're having an argument with this entity in the car. They give him a persona. Meanwhile, if you have them sit next to each other in a park, they might become best of friends. Do I know this person would be a correct question to ask at that moment. Why am I getting angry? Do I even know this person? Maybe they're in a hurry. Maybe they need to get there before I do. Maybe whatever. But I simply don't have all the answers. That's humility. That takes courage. And Samaditi is all about courage. And when you see Lord Buddha sitting in that posture, it is the most courageous posture that any being could be in. Unshakable. Akuppa Chetu Vimutti. Unshakable, unperturbed serenity of mind. That's what Nibbana is. But we cannot experience Nibbana without first having samaditi. It's not going to be a miracle. No one is going to give us Nibbana. And this path is designed to take us directly to Nibbana. Let's not be confused about that. It's not just mindfulness, business. It is life transforming. And it starts with right view. And I will stop here and open for any questions or comments and thoughts you might have to share. So, yes. Um, talking about, as you mentioned just now, uh, we are not mindful. Uh, you know, sometimes situation, especially with your loved ones, like my mother, uh, I'm very mindful that she is, she has mild dementia. And being a dementia patient, uh, we do know the symptoms, you know, trigger points, anger, and so on and so forth. But being constantly uh, uh, exposed to her, taking well, taking care of her with all this anger, it tends to create a lot of negativity, negativity right, onto us. Although we try our best to think, mm -hmm. as you say, be mindful. Uh, that she's sick, right? She doesn't want to be sick. Uh, but the constant, like as you say, as you constantly receive this negativity, it will reach a point where anger, resentment, this detachment starts to appear in us. And we just want to say, you know, I, I need to stay away from her for a while. Uh, somebody needs to take care of her. I, I, I need a break. Is such action considered okay for you to, for, for, for one to take a break from the constant negativity that you have received hmm. from okay. the government? Oh yes, a very good question and it's very uh, real, pertinent 
with life. And uh, um, the thing to remind yourself of is, oh, the thing I mentioned earlier about extremes. Wrong views exist thanks to extremes. Right view is all about the middle path. If that is also uh, a tool, I mean, you could use that as a tool to help you in the middle of very difficult or, um, uh, you know, something that requires a little bit more effort for you to appreciate and understand and especially to find an outcome, a healthy outcome from it, just like the one that you're presenting here. Well, what is being neglected is the caretaker's well-being yours and your fellow uh, other individuals who are involved in the life or in the caretaking of this other individual who's experiencing dementia. We do have a level of tolerance, you know, just like your stomach. Right now, I'm presuming you have enough energy to do certain tasks without eating more food just this. But if you exceed that limit, then you will pay for it. Okay? And uh, in therapy, we call that uh, oftentimes uh, uh, self-care, and it's, it's basically due to vicarious trauma, where you become tra traumatized by this person, in this case, uh, who's experiencing the dementia. Yes, telling yourself or asking yourself, okay, why am I getting mad? This person has dementia. What if I have dementia and somebody was taking care of me? Would I treat them like this? Or would I be a little bit more apologetic? That is an okay question to ask, but the other person is not working on all engines, you know, all cylinders. So something must be done. So here's where I would suggest becoming a little bit more practical in your approach. Seeing that, uh, I think you inferred that there's more than one person who's taking care of this person, right? Okay, so putting yourselves on a calendar. Okay, so you divide the time of day. So if, let's say, every day you would be spending four hours with the dementia patient. Instead of spending four hours and burning yourself out, because you will, as, as you've mentioned, uh, having one more person coming to the picture where they take a little bit of the load and everybody is sharing. Maybe not do three or four hours straight. Maybe give yourself one hour or 15 minutes break every hour where you go outside and you practice, for example, walking meditation, turning off your phone, it's, a, it's key, cutting out social media at that moment where you're completely by yourself. If there's any grassy lawn area outside, let's say, take off your shoes, barefoot, walk on the grass, especially if it's kind of wet, it's nice. Relaxing. Listen to some nice music, or even better, listen to your breathing. Five, ten minutes. I guarantee it. You go back and drink water. And enough smiles to yourself. Or listen to a joke. People used to be surprised when I would say, in the mornings, when you wake up, if you're a gloomy, depressed kind of person, listen to five, ten minutes of stand-up comedy. Just comedy. Laugh. You know, when was the last time you laughed? And then go back to work with the person. Meanwhile, someone else was there. And also you're giving your permission, you're giving yourself permission, allowance for you to be okay. Because you are not the savior of the planet. And this is a natural process taking place. Lord Buddha called this aging. Aging. And the one other aspect of wrong view is 
hoping that there can be no suffering in the world. I'm going to remove all suffering from the world. What an idiotic idea to think that I will be able to remove all suffering from the world. There was a man who came to the Lord Buddha complaining and crying. He said, Lord, why do we have to die? Because he had someone die in his family. And Lord Buddha turns to him and asks, were you born? Were you born? And the man says, what kind of a question is that? Of course, I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm born. He says, if you're born, then you're going to die. It's a no-brainer, it's a very simple logic. Common sense, in fact. So, if you take away too much from yourself, you're going to burn out. Use wisdom, samma sati, and obviously samma ditti in this case, to say, okay, meet, have a meeting with the other individuals. I'm sure if you're affected, they're affected too. Because the other step that you mentioned about pulling away completely, that would be against the Dhamma. Because that would be neglect also. And you will have to pay for that to yourself, because then you have the guilt. When the person is no longer there or they become worse, you have to answer to yourself. And that can also turn into Kamma Vipaka, which is Akusala Kamma Vipaka, which is unwholesome uh, fruit or consequence of Kamma, which I, I, you know, I would advise against. Uh, does that help? Yeah. It's just that, uh, kind of like, in that situation, only mm. a few of us uh. are willing to come in the situation. Ah. But the other siblings uh, tend to talk a lot, but there's no action from them. Mm. So we end up, the two of us that is currently taking care is feeling us exhausted. Mm, mm, mm. Maybe changing the shift, let's say, if you go in the morning, go in the afternoon, have the other person come. And maybe you don't need to be with the person all the time. Maybe you can have them watch something funny. Uh, I remember I, we bought a DVD player for my father when he was uh, very sick. So for him to watch DVDs that he liked, movies that he liked. That got him away from being so fixated on uh, the pain that he was experiencing. Because he has to verbalize the pain somehow to someone else. And who's someone else? You are. But if the eyes, this is using it strategically, the six senses. Allowing his eyes to see something that is distracting. So, um, there was a documentary I've seen of, of uh, in, individuals with severe um, um, Alzheimer's, where doctors had said categorically that this person does not remember anything. Those parts of the brain are dead. Because uh, you can find it on YouTube. Um, his name is, I think, Fred, uh, an African-American, a black gentleman, uh, old a senior citizen, um, whose daughter, a middle-aged woman, would go every day to speak with him, and she would struggle and struggle, and he would just stand, sit there like comatose, no expression whatsoever, to the point where they had given up. So they're waiting for him to die. He just sits in a wheelchair, doesn't communicate. Until somebody has the bright idea to get him to listen, to, because he used to be a musician back in the 30s or 40s. Jazz musician. So they get him a small uh, like iPod, something like that, an MP3 player, with they record, uh, they, they download, uh, some uh, songs from his era and they put the headphones on and initially you, this, you see this on camera this is live this was recorded live and he's sitting there he's like this and then suddenly 
his lips move. And he starts moving his head. And if you pay attention, he is now humming the tune of the music. Suddenly, he starts to sing. This man who was like mute, deaf mute, he was now singing. Not only that, the daughter comes and communicates. And he recognizes her. And recognizes her, and then he also says, I used to sing these songs. So part of the brain responds beautifully to stimuli that specifically affects the uh, auditory uh, part of the brain. I don't know which part of the cortex, but I guess it's the auditory cortex part of it um, that is causing the person's so-called dead memories to show up. So I say this in encouragement for you to possibly try that. Um, I used to go to this nursing home years ago where I met this Romanian lady um, who had seen two world wars, wars and um, the communist regime in Romania. And um, I liked her. I didn't have anyone, in this, so it was an elderly home. I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any relatives there. I just felt like going to see. I said to myself, maybe there would be somebody who would like them to listen to them. So basically, they, you know, because I feel like elderly populations are neglected, because even though they are the living libraries of our history, our life, our experience. But in the world's culture today, they're neglected and abandoned, even by their own families, often. In some cultures, more than others, yes. But overall, it's the same. So I used to go and, 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 and spend time with her. She was 90 years old when I met her. She died at 97. For seven years, I used to be there every weekend. And I would sit next to her and, and enjoy uh, just hearing her stories to the point where she started to forget them. But guess what? Thanks to me listening to her stories, it was time for me to hit replay. And I was now returning to her, relaying back to her the stories she had told me about herself growing up in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. She adopted me as her grandson. I adopted her as my grandmother. <laughs> and she would say, how do you know these stories? And I say, Grandma, you told me this. And she would go, ah, that was her expression. But there was a, a beautiful spark in her eyes when I would, I would tell her, Grandma, do you remember this happens and then you went here, this is how you got married and your in-laws didn't like you and you, were, uh, you moved in with your husband in this huge villa in Romania before you know, communists came in and your mother-in-law didn't like you and you snuck out the balcony, the window, and you got on top of this mulberry tree and you sat there and you started eating mulberry fruits and suddenly she would remember and she would go, yes, and then she would continue the story. Yeah, she becomes alive. So that really brings her back because we call this person, unfortunately, uh, you know, common usage is, oh, this is a dementia patient. Well, first of all, they had a life and they have a name. It's not... It's like giving a person a, a, t a number, you know, which I resented as a as a psychotherapist, as a you know, in, in my office. I don't I don't want them to diagnose the person. You know, uh, it's a person, it's a human being with a bundle of stories. So, I'm hoping that these can. Good, good. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Great question.
So I'm hoping this was helpful. And uh, my intention is to allow us to uh, normalize coming back to our, of course, they keep saying, well, things are never going to get normal again. I think that's, no one has the right to say such things, such a stupid thing. I don't care who they are. Uh, we have this quality in us called resilience. And we definitely can improve upon. And we can learn from our mistakes. And we can do a lot better. And we can laugh even louder and smile even wider. So, um, yeah. And, uh, but we have to start with some maditi. So the next one uh, in this series, I would like to dedicate it to uh, the body. The body that is taking the brunt of it all, the, the most heaviest impact, and we can turn it around. And uh, so uh, we'll build on this. So hopefully this will be on online. And uh, yeah, that's the second one. So the video the, of today's recording, when it's up, people could use that as a foundation for the next and um, hopefully you'll have more questions. So let us do the uh, sharing of merits. I'll say it in Pali. Akasatha chabu matha deva naga mahidrika punyan tangan moditva chiranaka tulu kasasana Akasa tachabu mata deva naga mahindika punyantanga no moditva chiranga come to the sana. Akasa tachabu mata deva naga mahindika punyantanga no moditva chiranga come to mamparanti. Sadu, sadu, sadu. May you all be well. May the Triple Gem bless you and your loved ones. Sa -sa 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 -sa